as we go into our message, uh, one of the things I had uh, I had just uh, discovered is when you are when I share screen, you can actually instead of me when I share my slides instead of me being just a little box. Uh, like on the top, when I share a slide, you can actually do speaker view, and then now you can basically drag uh, one half of the screen over as much as you'd like. So you can actually now have a split screen. You could you can watch according to the you know half would be slides and half would be the speaker or the worship leader. So you might want to play with that because um, I know some people are a little frustrated that they always see the speaker or the worship leader in a very small box. So um, Grace had mentioned possibly we need to have a tutorial at some point uh, to, um, to, to just teach everyone the little tricks of the trade. But I am thankful that uh, we can gather together uh, for uh, this worship service and to continue to uh, reflect on uh, Christ, our coming uh, King uh, in Advent as we prepare for uh, his birth and uh, his coming again. Now, I don't know about you, but um, Christmas is just around the corner and I don't know how much preparations that you've done. Um, I know that uh, I think I'm a little bit behind and people will ask me, well, yeah, how you know how are things going in terms of your Christmas preparations? And I'm basically like, well, I still have a lot to do, but I did find this checklist, and uh, it's a Christmas preparation checklist. And I think one of the things that I need on my list is to bookmark this to use it for next year, um, because the checklist actually uh, shows that you know, eight weeks before, um, there's actually things to do. And uh, it might be a little small print, but uh, basically the eight weeks before is to brainstorm gift ideas and to make a holiday budget and to take a Christmas family photo. And uh, these are all great things. And then um, actually four weeks before is to, I think, is it four weeks or two weeks before to begin to uh, plan for your holiday meal. I don't think uh, we've begun to plan for our holiday meal yet, but we'll probably do that on Wednesday or Thursday. So basically I'm really behind. Um, and I, I know some of you are, are far more organized than I am. So uh, you probably have a better list than this, but that's part of what Christmas is about. We, we prepare for things. I know, I mean, we have put up lights in our house and we are sending out some cards and uh, buying gifts. And so these are all things that most at least Christians would do as we prepare for Christmas. Uh, but most importantly, we really want to uh, prepare spiritually. And that is why the church uh, throughout the centuries has observed Advent, uh, a preparation for uh, the, the coming of Christ in his birth and his coming again. And for each candle, there's a representative um, theme. And the theme for the fourth candle traditionally is peace. And so today we, 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 we can't, we would normally, well, last year, I think we began uh, lighting the candles at church. And um, excuse me, we really can't do that virtually very well. Uh, but it's just a reminder that in spite of all of the preparations that um, maybe we or our families may be making for Christmas that we want to continue to stay focused spiritually and to um, and to really remember that that the reason for the season is indeed uh, following and worshiping uh, Christ our Lord and our Savior. And today we're going to be looking at one of the Advent passages <clears throat> and it basically is the Song of Mary. And it is a uh, basically her response to the calling of God on her life, in her life, uh, through the, uh, the angel Gabriel. And so that is in Luke chapter 1. And I will have Zach, and he can go ahead and do our reading for us today. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will be called blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. 
He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Well, thank God for his word. And as we reflect on this passage, we see that as, uh, as, as Mary gave praise to the Lord, uh, she really rejoiced in her Savior. And so this is something that hopefully we can remember as well as we prepare for Christmas uh, spiritually. And we see that she rejoiced in her Savior uh, through a number of different um, uh, lines in this song of hers. And, it, and she says she begins by uh, singing, uh, writing, my soul glorifies the Lord. And actually in uh, Latin, uh, and this is, is the word magnifant, magnific I think it's magnifant, Mary's magnificant, magnificant, I think is the word. And um, because in Latin, it has this word mag magnificent, where, where it's, it basically means Mary magnifies the Lord or, or or glorifies the Lord. So this song of Mary uh, historically has, uh, has often been called uh, the Magnificent of Mary um, or Mary's Magnificent. And it's because uh, the focus uh, of this particular song is her praising and glorifying the Lord for all that he's done for her. And then, he, and then she goes on and says that my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. And what really struck me a, a couple of things. One is that um, how personal this is. This is my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. And so it's, you know, she, she just has the understanding of, 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 of having an intimate relationship with God and having an angel come and speak with you to um, basically call you to service and to be used by the Lord in his redemptive plan, I think would be a confirmation of that, uh, that relationship that she had with the Lord. But it's something I think that we can uh, reflect on as well, that uh, God's great redemption has touched us and we are now uh, children of the living God. And so, uh, and so also uh, in this, it also is a uh, a reminder uh, to me as any way that, that Mary also uh, realized her need for a savior, um, that she also was a, a, a sinful person uh, and that she really needed uh, God as her savior. I think one of the um, theological components of uh, Catholicism is called, I believe, the Immaculate Conception of Mary. And so the reason this came about is they, they were wrestling, theologians were wrestling throughout the ages of how could Jesus be born of a woman and maintain his sinlessness because, uh, because of the fall, we all have a sinful nature. So wouldn't it imply that Jesus would have a sinful nature if he was born of a sinful woman? And so kind of the theological solution, which doesn't really have biblical backing except for this philosophy that I'm going through, is that, um, is that Mary was born without original sin. And so, uh, but that would lead me to believe if you don't have original sin, you're not a sinner, you're not sinful, then you don't really need a savior. But Mary rather um, emphasized the fact that she needed, she rejoiced in God, her savior. So I, I really don't think Mary was different than any of the rest of us. And I think she, she, was, a, she was a sinner like all of us, uh, but nonetheless, God continued to use her. Uh, the details of how um, Jesus would have uh, been uh, guarded from original sin, um, maybe that is, a mystery, but we know that Jesus lit, led a perfectly sinless life, and so uh, definitely somehow, um, you know, through his divine nature and divine power and being filled with the, the spirit of God, he was able to, uh, to, to live out a, a sinless and a righteous uh, life. Uh, but nonetheless, we see here that, that Mary is rejoicing as a response of her calling. And then she goes on later in verse 48, uh, from now on all generations will call me blessed. And this actually reminded me 
of uh, another Catholic um, thing. Basically, it's a prayer. It's it's the the Hail Mary. Now, um, Protestants don't pray the Hail Mary. Protestants don't really um, recognize uh, very much uh, the Hail Mary. Um, but this is the Hail Mary. I grew up Catholic, and so that's why I can interject some of these Catholic, uh, Catholic things. Uh, but the prayer, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. So actually, the first part of the Hail Mary, I think, is perfectly acceptable for all Christians. Because when it says Hail Mary, um, that's actually the, the wording of the King James. Hail, the more recent translations uh, are greetings, like greetings in the Lord, greetings, Mary. And it's basically, I believe, from verse 28 of Luke 1. And it's when Gabriel uh, appeared to Mary. And he, the angel basically said, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And so this comes, this first part of the this prayer is actually um, scriptural. It comes from uh, from from Gabriel. And then it says, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. And this blessed are you among women is from our passage today. And um, though blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus, well, we, that may not be scriptural, but Jesus, I, I think we can affirm that, that, uh, that Jesus, uh, indeed, uh, the, the fruit of her womb, Jesus, uh, is definitely blessed. Uh, going on in the prayer, uh, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Well, this kind of gets into praying to saints and the like. Uh, Catholics would never say, well, at least Catholic priests or theologians wouldn't say that you pray to a saint. It says, it basically says here, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. So the request is for Mary to pray for us, not for us to pray for her. It's kind of a nuance, but uh, nonetheless, um, I'm not, and most Protestants aren't that comfortable praying a prayer like this. But I wanted to at least point out the fact that, um, that indeed, even throughout the centuries, even now, uh, and Catholics for sure, but even scripturally, we can see that um, it is acceptable to call Mary blessed, and she indeed um, acknowledge that. And, and this, I think, was also a praise that she had uh, to God, that God was working in her life. Uh, God did indeed work in her life, would continue to work in her life, and this was a source of praise. And so I think, um, similarly, we should count our blessings and thank God for all that he's done in our life, <coughs> excuse me, and for the fact that that he, he really wants to use us. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that God's calling us means an easy life. Mary was, I think, just off the high of having this encounter with <clears throat> uh, the angel and responding in the affirmative, but her life wouldn't get any easier from there. Her calling didn't entail that she would uh, have, it, have it easy or that things would just go smoothly. Um, she would have to have a difficult conversation with her family, uh, with her fiance, Joseph, that indeed she was pregnant, um, basically out of wedlock. And, um, and as we know, um, Joseph even contemplated uh, maybe silently uh, divorcing her or separating from her. And so I think that was, was definitely a different, difficult conversation. And, and as she was raising Jesus, she also would have to go through uh, the, the pain of, of later on in his life as he uh, had to suffer so much on his road to the cross and his ultimate um, uh, crucifixion. And so this is all something that as a, as a mother, as the mother of Jesus, as a mother of the, of the Messiah that she had to bear. So um, we don't necessarily uh, praise God just because, uh, because of all, because of our circumstances, but we praise God uh, because of his goodness and grace in our life and for the strength he gives even in the midst of difficulty. And so let us with Mary praise the Lord. As we, oh, actually, um, <clears throat> the, uh, in the scriptures, too, as we, as we praise the Lord, we also see uh, that different ways that she did glorify the Lord, specifically. Um, and so, 
um, she recognizes that that God has uh, been mindful of her, uh, that that He remembered her, that He remembers her. Uh, again, it points to the personal relationship that she had with her Savior, and also she recognized the mighty things that that the God had done for her. Um, and so these are more like means of thanksgiving of God working in her life. Uh, but then also he, she turns to the character of God, uh, that, that his name is holy, that he indeed, God is holy, and that, his, and that God is merciful, is that his mercy extends to those who fear him. And so God is a God of mercy, God is a God of holiness, God is a personal God, uh, one that looks after uh, one, uh, after each of us. And so these are all means of praise. And so um, in a sense, we can, with Mary, praise the Lord uh, for how God worked in her life, uh, but also how God works in our life. And we can always turn our attention to God and his character. And so these are just reminders of some ways that we indeed can, um, can rejoice in our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we uh, move on in our passage, we see also that um, that Mary recognized revolution. Now, this may sound a bit strange, a bit odd, like what kind of revolution uh, are you talking about? It seems a bit radical. Uh, but I think when we examine the passage, we see that um, she doesn't may maybe quite understand everything, but she knows that Jesus is really going to uh, shake things up. And so uh, she declares that in her song, uh, that he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. Uh, he, God, has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He, had, he has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away empty. So these particular phrases, he has scattered those who are proud. Uh, so, you know, generally those who are proud are usually proud in something, their accomplishments or their, their financial well-being or, you know, any number of things, Pr proud in maybe their, 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 their family, their heritage, uh, but, um, but God will, will scatter those who are proud. God is in a, in in fact, in fact, in other parts of the Bible, uh, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so God will uh, uh, not, if, if the proud don't come to humility, eventually uh, they will be knocked down. Uh, but it also says that God brought, brought down rulers, lifted up the humble. So again, he, we're, we're seeing a, a shaking up of things. Um, and we know that God has uh, brought down rulers. Uh, if you read in the Old Testament about Nebuchadnezzar, we can say that that in a sense God humiliated him. At some point, uh, Nebuchadnezzar basically went crazy and was you know grazing in the field with the animals. Uh, he was proud and God humbled him. Uh, but we also know from uh, from history and 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 when we look at the uh, scriptures that indeed uh, God has. Uh, done great things and he has uh, basically su 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 supplanted kingdoms that were against him and, excuse me, rose up other kingdoms uh, that could be used for his glory. And so I think God continues to do that. But, and, but he lifts up the humble in the same way. And then he, he fills the hungry, uh, but he sends the rich away empty. So basically we're just seeing this kind of upside down um, kingdom or uh, just aspect of, of the Lord's working in the world. He's advocating here um, for the poor and for uh, the hungry and for the humble. Uh, and so I think this points to the fact that in indeed Jesus is a revolutionary figure. And to think that uh, after uh, Jesus's resurrection and his small band of followers began uh, in Palestine to, to begin to spread the, the good news of the kingdom uh, in, a, in, in a short 300 years, the, the Roman Empire, the, the pagan Roman Empire uh, would be totally reversed in its viewpoint of Christianity rather than uh, being uh, a, a government, a uh, kingdom that persecuted Christians um, in the early uh, 300s. Uh, 
Rome embraced Christianity as the official religion, or at least one of the official religions. And so that just points to the fact of the revolutionary aspect of God. And I really like this quote, uh, which points to this uh, by uh, Reverend uh, Billy Graham. Uh, he says, as Christians, we have responsibility toward the poor, the oppressed, the downtrodden, and the many innocent people around the world who are caught in wars, natural disasters, and situations beyond their control. And I think this is a true statement. If we look at scriptures, we do see that God has a desire to help the poor and the oppressed and the downtrodden. And he, in fact, has, has called us as people and his church to, to be a means of helping those uh, who are, are struggling in life, uh, who are downtrodden, who are poor, who are marginalized. Um, and, and we know, of course, that... Um, that Billy Graham's calling was as an evangelist um, and spreading the good news of the gospel and bringing people to Christ. And so though, although this may not have been his direct emphasis personally, because his giftedness was evangelism, he certainly recognized uh, that this is uh, the, the case that, that the church and his people need to live out uh, to help those, to, to help uh, meet the needs of the least of these. And what's What's really heartening is the fact that, that his son, Franklin Graham, really took this to heart. And so, um, and, and so through his organization that he founded, Samaritan's Purse, uh, they've been, in fact, able to, to help the poor and the oppressed and those who are, have undergone uh, natural disasters throughout the world to really be a means and instrument of God's love. And so, um, and so we... we we are called uh, to indeed uh, be God's hands and feet in the world. Now, as we, as we go on, um, we also know that um, the church always isn't uh, the best at, at living out the, uh, the message of the gospel and, 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 fulfilling our, our calling. And so um, uh, these are challenges and there's actually been some uh, high profile uh, failures uh, uh, in the past year of, of churches and ministries, uh, which you know probably isn't all that uncommon, uh, but there have been some high profile uh, issues and there's been some people that we've been talked about before that uh, have considered uh, and have claimed now that they no longer uh, follow Christ and they are apostate. And so, um, you know, these are things that we can uh, and should mourn over. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, they can be a warning to us and, 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 a warning to us and a reminder to really be able to uh, live out the gospel. Now, this particular picture of is of Justin Bieber. So some of you may know him as a popular singer uh, who's been popular ever since he was actually quite a young, a young kid. And the guy next to him is Pastor Carl, I believe his name is Carl Lentz. And Carl Lentz is the, uh, or had been uh, the pastor of, um, of Hillsong Church in New York City. Now Hillsong, most of us know Hillsong through, uh, through a lot of music that is produced by them. And many of the songs that we sing and play are actually uh, Hillsong songs. And so uh, overall, I think they're, they are a pretty good church. They're a mega church. They were, um, they were um, founded in Australia and uh, they have branches in most of the major at least English speaking cities of the world. And they've really been able to do a uh, pretty phenomenal outreach in urban areas. Uh, one of the things in America, especially, is that they have been kind of a church to the stars, uh, both in Hollywood and New York. A lot of celebrities, a lot of actors, musicians, um, sports figures um, have come to Christ or, or have been part of their. Um, have been part of their ministry. Um, but all that being said, um, if you haven't read the news, Pastor Lentz actually was caught in an adulterous affair, and so he was relieved of his duties. And as there's been uh, more reporting on the matter, um, you know, there's there's been additional complaints. And one of them uh, that 
that kind of struck me was in their in the church's desire to reach celebrities in a sense they had cultivated kind of a celebrity culture and so if you happen to be a celebrity and you went to a hillsong church maybe in los angeles or hollywood or wherever um, they had a vip section and so they this they wanted the celebrities to to be able to sit in this special section and celebrities often had access where other um, access to pastors and leadership that maybe most of the uh, people that were, you know, the members of the church, uh, those who were attending the church really didn't have that kind of access. I think they were still getting care through their small group leaders, uh, but you just couldn't necessarily go up and talk to the pastor after the service, but the pastors would be glad to speak to the celebrities. And so, you know, in a sense, there's good and bad. They, they've done a phenomenal outreach in this particular area in reaching urban and, and powerful and famous people. But also, I think there's a warning because God calls us not to have favoritism. So again, as we reflect on, on our, verse for, our verses for today, um, God um, is looking out for the poor and is looking out for the downtrodden. And in fact, the way that we're to treat each other is to be without favoritism. So in James chapter two, James reminds us uh, as the church, my brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And so here, and then, he, and then James goes on and explains more about uh, the, the, the evil of favoritism. And I couldn't help but think, you know, there's the kind of big sin, uh, sins out there like adultery that unfortunately this pastor had succumbed to. But also, you know, there's uh, maybe more subtle, um, you know, sins and, and seeking to, to reach the famous and kind of utilize their fame to help grow the church uh, also can have a tremendous downside because we're not supposed to show favorites favoritism. And in fact, I had read in one particular article that a lot of the celebrities didn't feel that comfortable taking those VIP seats. And so uh, many of them uh, refused to actually uh, sit there uh, because they didn't really want to necessarily feel different than other brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, but indeed, our calling in the Lord is to, uh, to not show favoritism and to treat people uh, as we would want to be treated and to treat everyone uh, with God's love and with his grace, whether they're part of our congregation or, or it's part of an outreach that we're seeking to do uh, to people in our community or even around the world. And so indeed, uh, Jesus was a revolutionary figure, uh, but he's called us to live in a, in a revolutionary way as we seek to, uh, to reach the least of these and to be his hands and feet in our world. As we uh, move on in our passage, uh, the final thing uh, that, that we can reflect on is that uh, Mary uh, remembered God's promises. And I think that is also a uh, good um, reminder for us as well. And so she sings, she writes, he has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he had promised our ancestors. And so Mary is praising the Lord for how God had, had been an ever-present help for Israel and had sought to, uh, to really guide his chosen people into uh, the way that they should go and to be a means of God's redemption uh, and a means of his peace and his grace and his salvation. And in fact, this all began with Abraham and the promise that God had to Abraham. And, and Mary is pointing to the fulfillment of that promise. Now, what was the promise of Abraham? Well, it was basically in a couple of at least two, maybe more passages in Genesis. I know Genesis 12, and I think later on in chapter 17. Uh, but here in Genesis 12, um, God appeared to Abraham and he said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. All of the families of the earth will be blessed in you. And so here's... Um, 
here's Abraham and and he was I believe there was no child of promise at this time and uh, no child but God comes to him and said you know I'm going to make you a great nation I am going to uh, bless bless your family and uh, you, you know you will have a son and 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 he will be blessed and he will carry on your line to the point that eventually uh, you will be a great nation and you will be a blessing to all the nations. And we know that this indeed was fulfilled uh, through Jesus, uh, that, uh, that Jesus was in his lineage and in his line and that uh, through his birth, uh, coming to earth, to, uh, to live out God's plan of redemption and to eventually die on the cross for our sins that made a way uh, for us to receive God's salvation, to be made right with God and to indeed become sons and daughters of God and in becoming sons and daughters of God, uh, becoming uh, children of Abraham as well. And of course, that got me to remember the old um, many, I think it's probably still sung in Sunday school uh, classes and BBSs even now, but there's uh, the old children's song, Father Abraham. And one of the, I think the chorus goes, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you. So let's all pr praise the Lord. And then it goes on right arm, left arm, right foot. Well, I think because as this part of the song, the kids need to get active. And so they're shaking their feet and hands and heads and things like that. But, but this, though this is a children's song, I do think it has a profound truth that indeed Father Abraham uh, had many sons because of God's uh, blessing and working in his life. Uh, and ultimately, I am one of those sons of God and and others of you are also sons, and others of you who have accepted Christ as your Savior are daughters uh, in the Lord. So we're all part of God's family. We're all sons and daughters of, of Father Abraham. And I think Mary recognized this. Uh, she recognized how God uh, had uh, been faithful in his promise to Abraham. And I don't think at this point she particularly knew all of God's plan of redemption. Uh, but it, for us, uh, we know how God uh, worked uh, through Jesus and the cross. And uh, indeed, we can praise him as well, that indeed, um, God uh, has called us to be his children, that God uh, seeks indeed to bless the nations of the earth. So how can we live this message out? Well, I think maybe by reflecting on this uh, point. Prepare for Christmas by remembering Mary, who rejoiced in God, her Savior, and who was used by God in his plan of redemption. And so let's seek, and I encourage you to, to, to reflect on, to remember Mary, who rejoiced in God, her Savior. And, and actually, that's maybe the main point of this song of Mary, uh, this mag Magnificent of Mary, that that, that we're called to magnify God, that we're called to rejoice in the Lord. We, we can rejoice in, the, in God for his character, uh, for how he works in our life, uh, for his plan of redemption, and for how he desires to use the church to make a difference in the world, which indeed he is uh, continuously accomplishing. Uh, but also, uh, we can uh, reflect on Mary and how God was used by God in his plan of redemption. Indeed, God is a revolutionary God, and God's desire is that he use his church and he use those of us who are his disciples uh, to make a difference in the world. And that means uh, treating people uh, in a way that reflects uh, the love of God and treat them how we would want to be treated. Uh, and indeed seeking to, uh, to reach the least of these and to make a difference uh, for God in the world. And also utilizing our giftedness and calling of God. Uh, Mary uh, was called in a very unique way to live out God's plan of redemption in her life. Uh, but indeed, we all are uh, receive gifts of God from the Holy Spirit and, and callings from God. Uh, and, and some of those callings um, are in ministry, in, in God utilizing our gifts, but also in God calling us to make a difference uh, in, our, in, in our world in whatever context that he calls us, whether, whether at home or whether in our communities, uh, in our workplaces, uh, and, and even uh, as we seek to, to reach those uh, cross-culturally uh, throughout the world as we partner with 
uh, missionaries like uh, Ruth as we're praying for her even uh, today. And so God indeed really uh, desires that we uh, seek him and follow him and, and make a difference for him. We, we be, it begins with praise, but uh, it uh, results in action. And so let us this week uh, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in all that he's done for us and, uh, and, and as he seeks to, to, to work uh, through in our world and through our lives. So let's pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, uh, we do uh, thank you and praise you uh, for your goodness and grace and love. We thank you for all that you've done uh, through, uh, through your plan of redemption and through uh, your servant Mary. And we thank you, Lord, that her response uh, to your calling in her, in her life was to embrace that, that calling, uh, but then to also rejoice in that calling and to praise you for all the great things that you have done. So help us, Lord, as well to, to give you thanks and praise in our lives. And we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.